Well, Pastor Craig spoke last week about the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, and so I thought I would stay in the vineyard this week. I have always been a big, big fan of the vineyards. When uh, Tammy and I got married, my dad was an artist, and I said, Dad, for my wedding gift, I'd like you to paint me a picture of a Victorian house, but I want it set in a vineyard. And it's been hanging on our wall for 35 years almost. Why vineyards? I don't know. Partly because I've always liked things that are neat and orderly. And I look at a vineyard, I look at those parallel rows and those neatly trimmed vines. And that, that, that part of me that's OCD just kind of <laughs> looks at that and says, hubba, hubba, hubba. <laughs> but I also spent four years between college and between seminary working for the Rodney Strong Vineyards in Sonoma County, California. And part of my job for those four years was to walk the vineyards every fall prior to harvest, where I would test for sugar levels within the grapes so that the winemaker would know the exact right time to, to harvest those grapes for their perfect readiness. The bonus was I got to eat all the grapes that I possibly wanted. And I marveled one year in particular as I walked through uh, one vineyard, a Chardonnay vineyard, the Chalk Hill Vineyard. It was, a, it was a long vineyard. And because of different soil conditions, the grapes would ripen at different times on different sides of the vineyard. And as I'm tasting my way through the vineyard, I noticed one year how the, the taste of the Chardonnay grapes started at this end, tasting just like a tart pippin apple. And by the time I got to this end, I could taste that sweet Bartlett pear and it was fascinating to me. Maybe not to you, but it was to me. There's something about working with nature, though. Whether it's in your garden, in your backyard, or at home, or in a vineyard, that I think intuitively helps us to understand something important about life principles. Working with plants teaches you patience. And it helps you understand the cycles of life in a unique way. I think that's why Jesus used so many illustrations, not from his job as a carpenter, but, but from the world of agriculture, as he taught his principles, telling stories at different times about fig trees, or the sowing of seeds, or about wheat and tares, or in three different places, the analogy of the vineyard. And our passage this morning is all about grapevines. Woohoo! Because Jesus uses the grapevine to teach us something about the quality of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. This morning we're in John chapter 15. And so we're going to learn some lessons from the vineyard. In this chapter, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You were already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a person remains in me, they will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, they're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And skipping now to verse 16. 
He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. I want to talk this morning about fruitfulness as it relates to four things. I want to talk about connection. I want to talk about correction. I want to talk about rejection. And I want to talk about inspection. Let's start with that connection. You know, commercial grapevines, they're not just grown from seeds like you'd grow corn or a soybean or a tomato. Grapevines are produced through a process called bud grafting. In bud grafting, farmers take that little sliver of a bud that's been grown on a grapevine that is specially bred for the flavor and the quality of the fruit. And then they graft those buds into the rootstocks that have also been specially grown and bred for their strength and their disease resistance. Now that little bud by itself, it's not viable. It cannot live on its own. It becomes viable when it's slipped into the rootstock and it grows into the plant. It has to reestablish the necessary physical pathways, the, the, the plumbing of the plant, so that it becomes connected to the plant that will allow it to receive the nutrients and the water that the roots draw up from the soil. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. How we as believers need a vibrant connection to our Father. The focus of our faith is not simply knowing about Jesus, but it's about having this living, dynamic, spiritual connection to God through Jesus. This connection is, is somewhat, it's, it's mystical, it's, it's hard to define, but it's what allows us to be fruitful. And so Jesus uses the metaphor of being grafted, of being connected to the vine to teach this spiritual truth. In fact, he has a term for this connection. He calls it abiding in Christ. That word abiding is found ten times in this one chapter. Some translations, like the one I use, use the word remain. But that's a good word. Abiding in Christ remain, uh, means remaining connected to Christ. Now, if Jesus were teaching today, I don't think he'd use this analogy. He would use the analogy of, of having a constant internet connection with our Father. And how do we know if we're connected to Christ? It's real simple. You'll bear spiritual fruit. What does that mean to bear fruit? It means that we mature in our faith to the point that we develop Christ-like character. Author Jerry Wright put it this way. He says, as I reflected on the meaning of maturity, I realized that there was a central mark of maturity. In the human physical realm, maturity is gauged by when a person is able to bear or father children. A tree is mature when it bears fruit. A stalk of grain is mature when it's ready to be harvested. In all creation, fruit bearing is the preeminent mark of maturity. He continues saying, certainly the spiritual realm differs little. A mature believer bears fruit of two kinds. The first is that of character and holiness of life. The second is becoming a spiritual parent by leading others to Christ. So what is this Christ-like character? It's called the fruit of the Spirit, found in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if the vine is cut off, the connection is severed, and it leads to only one inevitable conclusion. It will wither and die, and will never bear fruit. And it's amazing how we can fool ourselves at times into believing that we can cut ourselves off from the very things which sustain our connection with Jesus. We can cut ourselves off from prayer 
from study in the word, from worship, from obedience, from service, and still have the power and the ability to bear fruit. Now, bearing fruit only happens when we remain connected to Christ. We remain vitally abiding in Christ through the practice of spiritual disciplines. That's connection. Let's talk about correction now. If the purpose of of the vine is to bear fruit, then the wise gardener shapes his vines to maximize their yield, right? He doesn't just want a lot of fruit. He wants an abundance of very high quality fruit. And one way they do this is by pruning. I've spoken of this before. Pruning has a twofold purpose. One, it's to remove the parts of the plant that are dead. They're worthless, they're lifeless, they will never bear fruit. But pruning also involves removing or trimming back the living, productive, fruitful branches in order to redirect the growth where you want it. Vineyards get pruned back every winter, and they get cut back hard because pruning is necessary for a healthy vine. And the principle that was drummed into me in my classes is that pruning is above, first and foremost, an invigorating process. It leads to growth. And so if our purpose as Christians is to bear fruit, well, doesn't it make sense then that God would seek to remove those parts of our lives that he understands are not, uh, they're dead, that are worthless? Would he not want to redirect our time and our growth and our energy and our vision into those things that produce fruit? You may be going through a trial of sorts. Maybe some element of your life has been taken away from you and you don't understand what God is doing in the midst. You may be going through a trial of sorts and you're wondering, why is this happening? Why is God allowing this this pain in my life? I thought God loved me. Why is he allowing this to happen to me? Well, friends, it may be helpful to consider that those very trials you're going through are actually an indication of how much God loves you and cares about the fruitfulness of your life. The presence of trials in our life is a positive sign that God is actively working in the midst of your life circumstances to cleanse you, to shape you, to redirect you so that you will continue to become more mature and to bear even more fruit. And if you will simply endure, if you will allow God to work in your life, you will find yourself being invigorated. Now let's, let's talk about rejection. Verse 6, it warns us. It says, If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Boy, that's a difficult verse to interpret. Some take it to mean to that that Christians who do not actively bear fruit are rejected by God and they lose their salvation. An interpretation that frankly is not supported by scripture. Others believe that it refers to the destruction of the impure works in the life of a believer and that certainly is a very valid interpretation. But I think we can understand this verse best if we understand and remember that Jesus said these words right after Judas, one of the twelve who had spent three years traveling with Jesus, witnessing his life, ministering with him. Judas had just left the disciples to go and betray Jesus. And the sad truth we should be aware of is that there are some we will encounter within the Christian community, people who may call themselves believers who may actually even do good works, yet they are not grafted into the true vine, who is Jesus Christ. Judas was one of these. Just because a plant grows in a vineyard doesn't make it a grapevine, does it? 
Judas was one of these unfruitful branches, as is anyone who is not connected vitally to Jesus Christ. You can say the right words, you can know all the Christian lingo, you can do good deeds, but if you're lacking that vital spiritual connection to Christ, they are truly not worthy of the name. We cannot always tell who they are, although their lack of fruitfulness may give us an indication. And for these unfortunate persons, this passage teaches that judgment is their end. And just as the farmer burns the debris that results from pruning, God will reject and judge those who have no true connection to Jesus. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? So let's talk about the last point. Let's talk about inspection. And this is simply a way of saying that there are Signs that indicate the quality of our connection to the true vine. Let me suggest four questions you can ask yourself this morning to do a mini evaluation of your own life. Question number one is a simple one. Am I bearing fruit? A healthy vine bears lots of a fruit. And verse 8 tells us that the way we show that we're God's disciples, the way that others recognize that we are Christians is by bearing fruit, an abundance of fruit that will last. What's the harvest like in your life right now? Is the fruit of God's Spirit evident? Are you involved in the life of the church? Are there attitudes, are there activities in your life that perhaps need to be trimmed so that you can be more fruitful? Are there energies and talents and dreams that need to be redirected from serving yourself to serving those around you? You know, if you're younger, there's always a temptation to say, I have time later. I'm too busy right now, I'm I'm getting my, my, my life, I'm getting my career organized now. When things settle down a little bit later, then I will be more focused on developing my relationship, my spiritual life with God. But remember what Jerry White said about maturity. The goal is to bear fruit. And for those of you who are older, there's an equal temptation to say, you know, my fruitful years, they were earlier in life. I've done my part for Jesus. It's someone else's turn. It's time for others to provide for the harvest. But one thing I've noticed is that fruit trees, well, they bear fruit until the very end. My wife Tammy lives in California. Her parents, not not my wife, her parents live in California. (laughs) My clicker has stopped working. And they live near a, uh, they live near a, uh, an apple orchard. A very, very old apple orchard. And you can tell it's old because the, the trees, they're, they're twisted and they're gnarled. And sometimes there's a stump with one branch swinging off this way. And you can tell it's at the end of its life. But every summer when we go visit, that tree, those trees, they're just loaded with apples. That's what God wants for us too. In God's vineyard, you're never too old. You're never too young to be fruitful. So if you're bearing fruit right now, that's great. Keep it up. Good work. God is being glorified in your lives. Question two. Am I being obedient to God's word? Verse 10 says that the evidence of our love of God is obedience to his word. Jesus said, why do you say, Lord, Lord, yet not do what I say? Our ability to be used by God to bear fruit is dependent on our willingness to do what God asks us to do. A third question, is my prayer life filled with confidence? Why should it be filled with confidence? Because God promises in verse 7 that if we remain connected to Jesus, and if we are obedient to him and his words remain in us, Whatever we ask for in prayer, God will answer. It'll be done for us. Don't take this as a promise, though, to think that Jesus is somehow our magic genie who will fulfill our every desire. 
But it's God's promise that because God wants us to be fruitful, any prayer that will increase our ability to bear fruit is a prayer that God will want to answer. And a final question. Am I filled with joy? Completely. Joy comes from fulfilling the purposes for which God has created Joy comes from knowing that God loves us enough to remove those things that may be keeping us from being fruitful and fulfilling our potential. Joy comes from bearing spiritual fruit, from leading others to Christ. You know, tucked away in a corner of my alma mater, University of California at Davis, is the Winkler Vine. The Winkler vine is the largest single grapevine in America. And the base of the vine is as wide as a large tree trunk, and the canopy of this one vine stretches out over 10,000 square feet. They use it to host dinner parties for special guests of the university. And it's an incredible thing to stand under its shade on a hot, sunny day and feel so cool especially when there's fruit hanging down through the canopy. This one vine, all by itself, produces a bountiful harvest. And friends, that's, that's the kind of church God wants us to be. Every Christian, busy being fruitful, and yet we're all connected to one another and to the one vine who is Jesus Christ. So let's prepare ourselves to be part of an abundant harvest. Amen? Amen. Amen.